Vanakkam, I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. James Matthew to the show, our guest. I'm sure we will have a good time of chat with him on his book of books, which is a very unique one. Dr. James Matthew hails from Kerala, and he is settled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, United States of America, and is a great and renowned cardiologist. But his passion is for a field that is connected to literature, connected to philosophy, and also to the scriptures of both the West and the East. The book of books which is getting published in India is a unique one. And this is a string of pearls of wisdom through the meandering streams of history, of literature, of scriptures, and also noble thoughts that have helped us in developing a culture, a civilization that unites mankind. Welcome, Dr. James Matthew, uh, to the show, our guest. Can you brief us how your project, Book of Books, started? Vanakam, Mr. K. Kunji Krishnan. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. I am delighted to be here. And thank you for the uh, good question. The overarching theme of the book is East-West interaction or conversation, if I may, between two cultures and two uh, religions and, and the literatures of uh, East and West. Well, I was growing up in India during my high school days and perhaps early college days. I have read random quotes from the early intellectuals of America, particularly you know, who are known as the transcendentalists, namely Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson and the like. At the same time, you know, the names of India's, modern India's uh, intellectuals were all also household names. So obviously I read a little bit about Mahatma Gandhiji and Rabindranath Tagore, but only after I've been in the US approximately in 1984, I really happened to see a copy of uh, probably the single most famous book by Thoreau. the American philosopher Henry David Thoreau, namely Walden. So I'm still reading Walden. And then Henry David Thoreau's books introduced me to fellow transcendentalists and other contemporary you know, philosophers of the mid 19th century. So one thing that struck me profoundly was how much these transcendentalists were influenced by ancient India's scriptures. literature and particularly the scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads and literature like you know, Kalidasa, Shakuntala. So that you know, elicited my curiosity to know more about these profound writings from India that influenced this American uh, philosophers. So that led to a, a theme of interest, the exchange of cultures and literature between the East and the West. And therefore, you know, I started collecting you know, rare books and some manuscripts and some historical artifacts, artifacts related to my favorite authors from both, and, from both East and the West. The, the collection grew and so did my desire to offer this to the world and, and obviously it is difficult to invite the world you know to where these books and artifacts are kept so i came up with the idea of writing a book about my books and it is properly titled uh, book of books now can you tell me the process of your collection some of these manuscripts and historical artifacts are sought after by myself some of them 
just come to me and some of them are occasionally thrust upon me. Because of the internet and the easy accessibility to all the data you know, in various parts of the, the world, it has become relatively easy to search and find if you know what you want to find. So once I developed this theme, namely East-West exchange of you know, philosophy and, and uh, spirituality, then I knew what kind of artifacts and manuscripts I wanted to acquire. So I actively you know, look for it, uh, to specifically referring to the very first uh, time Gitanjali appeared in a book format. By reading about Rabindranath Tagore, you know, various biographies, I knew that there is such a limited edition of Gitanjali published in 1912. In, in uh, somewhere around. So I actively look for it. Uh, my search led to the rare book library of UWM, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee campus. So I went there and you know, asked the rare book librarian, you know, can you show me, you know, the Rabindranath Tagore's, you know, first edition of Gitanjali. And, you know, he gave me a time and because he had to go into some archival room and bring it out and he was wearing white gloves and everything and, and he had to sit by me before I could even, you know, cast my eyes on it. And when I saw it, it was amazing. Uh, not only that, you know, it is so rare, but the way it was printed and made into a book, it was all printed on handmade paper. Uh, it was covered in silk cloth, white color. And all the letterings on the covers were golden in color. Oh. Only 750 copies were printed, printed, of which only 250 were available for purchase. And I am pretty convinced that I had one of these 500 copies which were not for sale because not only that, you know, it, it was very well maintained in, in mint condition, but it also came with a card with this hand signature of Gurudev. So, oh. <laughs> so that was very special. Uh, as you know, I have a co-author of my book. You know, he uh, that was my next question. Actually. Yeah, okay. Oh. So I'll just say that and I will you know, try not to let the cat out. Uh, so anyway, my Ken Big Nail you know, had a collection uh, uh, and he had a similar interest. When Henry David Thoreau read the first print proof, he asked for an additional three line space before a new paragraph started. And that is, space was important to him. So that was his way of emphasizing what was going to follow. Hmm. So he, he you know, sent the publisher asking for additional space. And the publisher and the printer were very smart. They had just removed three lines from the above paragraph and allowed more space there. So I could see you know, how furious Henry would have been when he saw it. Why so much of, out of the 340 pages of the book, uh, you have devoted, uh, I think, around 80 pages, more than 80 pages, if I remember right, for Thoreau. Then the next uh, person who has so much of uh, coverage in the book is Rabindranath Tagore. Why so much on Thoreau? I have asked this question, you know, myself many times, you know, how do I get attracted to a particular writer or a poet? And I will come to that. Uh, but before that, he is the one who introduced me to the transcendentalists and their writings. And his writings are very readable and it very very, and it is a commentary on, on the society of his time. A lot of prophecies. So not only a poet, but he was also a naturalist and he was a surveyor and he he lived mostly by the labor of his hands. Uh, so therefore, his personality was so attractive to me. In one of Henry David Thoreau's you know, writings, in his journals, my life had been the poem that I would have read, but I cannot both live and utter it. Oh. He himself is the poem. I immediately dawned upon me. That's what distin with India. distinguishes him as their poet. Not that a person can write nice poetry, but his life has been the poem. The same thing can be said about our own Rabindranath Tagore. So that's why 
those two figures, one from the west and one from the east, stand out to me as very, very distinguished. And obviously, I have collected all the writings of Henry David Thoreau that is available, all his books in first edition, you know, and some of them with special associations. I have them. All books of Rabindranath Tagore. Yeah, forty of them. Yeah, available in English language, yes. and many of them have qualifications. You know, some of them he has signed by himself. I have a signed copy of the poetry collection called Gardner. Uh, I have you know a few photographs, professional photographs of um, the poet uh, with his signature on it, and I have some autographs you know of Rabindranath Tagore. So these were representatives of East and West, whom I got attracted to. Okay. Not only because they were great writers, but they were poems by themselves. <laughs> okay. I also find that you have first editions of translations of Kalidasa. How the first edition of Bhagavad Gita translation, because that was the one which united the Western and Indian philosophies. First time any Indian literature, you know, be it scripture or be it a drama was that of the Bhagavad Gita by Charles Wilkins. Wilkins, yes. Wilkins, and this was That's in 1700 and correct. Yeah, this was in 1785. <coughs> in those days, you know, the, the the British, you know, viceroy or whoever was controlling India, you know, had great deal of influence in what is published, and you know, they could you know promote things or they could not promote things. So he had the full support of the, the whoever was in the British authority, and also you know ironically East India Company. So they were all associated with East India Company. But it is worth noting that these intellectuals from England came to India, le mastered our language, language like Sanskrit, and then bothered to translate some of those most important works for the outside world to see. So the first such book has, which has been ever translated to any European language was uh, Bhagavad Gita. the Bhagavad Gita by uh, Charles Wilkins. Kalidasa Shakuntala was first translated into English by Sir William Jones. Same connection. They are all connected with the East India Company. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. That was their main business. <laughs> yes. But he also became a Sanskrit scholar. And I think he was a professor of Sanskrit or something at one of the European universities. So he uh, translated this into English in 1785. So eight, 10 years after the Gita was Gita translated. Was, yes. And that was a major event in Europe and America, you know, in the literary world. And so much so that, you know, uh, Goethe, you know, commented about the Kalidasa Shakuntala in beautiful poetic language, which I'm afraid I cannot recite. Yes. But basically, it, it says, if you want one word that encompass all the emotions in the world and all the seasons of the world and the flowers and the plants and everything in one word, give me Shakuntala. <laughs> yeah, Shakuntala. Yeah, yeah, Shakuntala. That's how, how much he was impressed. And that became a, became, you know, very significant event in the world of literature in, in Europe and America. The book was in 1785, and this particular volume belonged to uh, the, the, the British King's you know, palace. Uh, Queen Charlotte you know, owned this copy of the book, which then you know, went from hand to hand, and finally it is in, you know, in, in my TGM Rare Book Museum. So thank you for asking me that question. Yeah. You have not only got Indian authors, but you have the great Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam. Mm. I find two translations, mm -hmm. and you have quoted those beautiful lines, which I, you know, it's very well known. It was something which inspires people in their youth. Mm -hmm. A book of verse underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me, singing in the wilderness. Oh. Wilderness for paradise now. Wow. <laughs> what a great uh, poem. Yeah. yeah, I have listened to and read this particular verses so many times, but now that you are reading it, I have goosebumps on my body. English translation of the Rubaiyat of Amar Khayyam by Edward Fitzgerald. I believe it was done in 1887. Yeah. And it has a number of 
associations with the particular volume that I have. Yeah. Then you have Tolstoy, you have Robert Frost, you have a galaxy of writers like <laughs> writers and statesmen. Can you dwell a little deeper into yeah, that? Yeah, so you know, this spans several continents as well as it spans several centuries of writings. So in terms of geographical you know, span and the temporal span, Tolstoy is a central figure. Yes. So I, you know, whereas I have heard and by hearted in the titles of Leo Tolstoy's books, it's a difficult read you know, <laughs> for, for a person. Slow reading. Yeah, a person like me. But what I like most about Tolstoy's writings are his non-fiction writings. And they are probably not as popular and well known as his famous fiction like Anna yes. Karenina or War and Peace. But actually what is captivating to me is his non-fictions. Uh, one of his famous book of non-fiction is titled The Kingdom of Heaven is Within You. Yes, yes. That's yeah. also again famous like Rubaiyat. Yeah, yeah. So, and then another book called uh, My Religion and My Faith, something like that. Another one called um, The Gospel in Brief. For a long time on the uh, contents of the book. Now, how, how much uh, was it easy to get to the first edition published I, in UK? Right. Uh, the idea of making a book out of my collection, which I had already named after my late father, T.G. Matai, um, and that was probably toward the end of 2019. I probably submitted a full draft by April, May of 2021. So it took a little more than one year, uh, let's say one and a half years, to come up with the first full draft of this uh, manuscript. But all the images are uh, very well. Having seen both the editions, mm -hmm. I can vouch that yeah. it has been beautifully produced. And all the book covers, handwritings, holographs, signatures of especially Tagore, Gandhi, and also Vivekananda. We did omit Vivekananda because he was the one who, you know, carried Indian religion, yeah. Indian religious thought to the West yeah. with his famous Chicago address. If it was not because of uh, strong encouragement from a person who is interviewing now, Sri K. Kunyakrishnan, oh. This might not have happened. Another person to whom I owe a lot uh, in encouraging me, in not only you know, saying good things about the book after he reviewed it, but also equally supported me to have a l more affordable edition is uh, uh, Sri Adur Gopalakrishna. I have a very rare volume of one of Swami Vivekananda's books. The book is titled Raja Yoga. The main title is Raja Yoga. There's a subtitle to it. Subtitle. And this book was published, I believe, in early 1900s. Uh, this particular volume contains you know, the essence of several of his series of lectures in various Western countries. And he put them together into this book called Raja Yoga. And what I'm going to say is, you know, again, give me goosebumps. Uh, this volume comes with a hand signature and inscription by the Swami. It's very rare. And I have to thank, you know, my, my friend in New Hampshire, Mr. Ken Bignail, for getting me that copy with the signature by, you know, by Swami Vivekananda. He's also a great admirer of the Swami. People might think you uh, think that to collect these first editions <laughs> what inspired you doing that and you must have spent a great fortune good fortune on these books see there is a special attachment that you could form with these authors by looking at their original versions and if not handwritten manuscripts minor things like you know a spelling error that they themselves corrected uh, something written marginally, you know, to be added in the print version. Uh, maybe, you know, a blot of ink, you know, somewhere. 
So a pause that you could see, you know, while they were writing. So all these minor things are inevitably lost when you print them out. And right. so there is something that is missing in print versions uh, of languages and words which have no form to, for the press. So that's one thing. And the other one is, um, you know, most people, I would think, buy books and they go for the least expensive version and they will, you know, read it and they will spill their coffee on it and, you know, so, <laughs> and they become, you know, the literally uh, bookworms. And it would be lucky if some of the worms get to eat them at least, so somebody gets benefited. Yes, yes. <laughs> but the thing about a, a true, you know, biblio, bibliophile is that they acquire these things for the love of it and the special for attachment positivity. to this. And yeah, yeah, it has a personality of its own. And, and, and those are actually, you know, the worth treasuring as well as passing on to uh, generations and nations as, you know, as possessions in your estate. So that is the attitude that I have developed in, in acquiring them. I never, you know, feel like I own them. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I've been fortunate to keep them for a while and it is my responsibility to pass it on and, you know, present, it, Nish, present it to the world. We could go endlessly because books are always inspiring. Thank you very much for being with us. And I do hope that book lovers of this channel would enjoy the conversation. Well, it was a honor and privilege, you know, to be interviewed by you on this program, and uh, I appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kunyakrishnan, as well as to Dura Darshan, who is broadcasting it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.